Coming up on Tech News Today, sneak peek at the Samsung Galaxy S4. Also, Amazon's move to dominate book domain names and the MakerBot's 3D scanner changes everything. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, March 11th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by The Resumator. Streamline hiring and increase traffic to job postings with The Resumator, the hiring solution used by today's fastest growing companies. For a free 30-day trial and 15% discount, go to theresumator.com slash TNT. And by GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix, a powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with colleagues and clients from anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face-to-face -face with HD video conferencing, even from an iPad. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use promo code TNT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPad, Samsung Galaxy, and other smartphones are worth at Gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. Uh, Sarah Lane's still on vacation in search of Pitbull in Miami, but we're here to tell you the top tech stories of the day, starting with the top 10 in the news feeds. Pictures posted to a Chinese forum appear to show the Samsung Galaxy S4, if you believe them, expected to be announced Thursday in New York. Photos show a case similar to the Galaxy Note 2 with a white back, and specs appear on a benchmark app that matched those previously leaked by other sources, including Android 4.2.1, 1080p display, 2 gigabytes of RAM, and a 13 megapixel camera. Now, oh, forget about the S4. Let's talk about the BlackBerry Z10. Yeah. It's official. AT&T will start selling the BlackBerry Z10 for 200 bucks starting March 22nd, the Z10 is BlackBerry's touchscreen phone running the BlackBerry 10 operating system. Pre-orders start tomorrow. Amazon wants the .book, .author, and .read domain names all to itself. The Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers say that's anti-competitive. And Barnes & Noble thinks it's a threat to the freedom of the Internet. Any organization with $185,000 and proven technical competence can apply to ICANN to operate a top-level generic domain, uh, sometimes known as GTLDs. Google is amending its application for .search, .app, .blog, and .cloud to say it would not restrict their use to Google products. First round of approvals of these new generic TLDs is expected around April 23rd. EA's Lucy Bradshaw penned an apology for the way EA launched SimCity. She says that a lot of a lot more people logged in than EA expected. She said that was dumb and the company has increased server capacity by 120%. To make this apology package complete, EA will offer a free PC download game. EA will send out emails on March 18th to those who bought the game with redemption details. Bradshaw said today, quote, the core problem with getting in and having a great SimCity experience is almost behind us. Oh, be careful what you wish. Uh, lots of folks buzzing about Jackie Chang's photo gallery over on Ars Technica, showing off an early prototype of the iPhone from 2005, essentially a breadboard attached to a display. The device is about 5 inches by 7 inches and 2 inches thick, had USB ports, an Ethernet port, and even a serial port, probably for easy testing. The ARM chip inside looks like a variant of the Samsung S3C2410, which Ars writer Andrew Cunningham called an older and slower relative of the chip they eventually used in the first iPhone. Iranian officials say the country has blocked the use of illegal VPNs. The country filters internet content, but many have used VPNs as a workaround. Only legal and registered VPNs will be allowed in Iran. Back in January, Iran's Supreme Council of Cyberspace announced it would sell legal VPN services to businesses that needed them for security. Dell has reportedly entered into a confidentiality agreement with investor Carl Icahn. The move allows Icahn to review Dell's books and also talk to Dell's board of directors about the terms of the $24 billion leveraged buyout that attempts to take the company private. Icahn has publicly opposed the buyout. He favors what's called a leveraged recapitalization that keeps the company public and pays the shareholders about $9 a share in a special dividend. 
At South by Southwest, Google showed off a talking shoe concept. You heard me right. I said talking shoe. So what's a Google shoe like? Well, it's got a custom-made microcontroller and a circular speaker that gives you feedback based on how you move. The shoes also have Bluetooth support so you can sync it with your phone. Now, Google did say it had no plans to enter the shoe business, which is a downer because I think they could market them as the goose shoe. <laughs> Would you believe the first Steam box is here? Well, Ars Technica reports XI3 has started taking pre-orders for the Piston, a $1,000 computer and console form factor designed for HDTVs and planned for release during the 2013 holiday season. Linux-based box supports an integrated AMD chip, 3.2 gigahertz quad-core processing, and a 7,000 series Radeon GPU sporting 384 programmable cores. Comes with support for up to three monitors, including one HDMI output, along with whopping 12 I.O. ports, including eight USBs. XI3 was touted as a partner for the Steam Box from Valve at CES in January. And uh, according to PC World, buyers will be able to choose Steam as an option when ordering the piston, but also be able to choose Gaikai and EA's origin. Chip, heal thyself. Researchers at Caltech have created a chip that reconfigures itself when it faces transistor failure or reduced power. The self-healing chip uses a series of sensors that monitor power, temperature, and the integrated circuit. In the case of failure, the chip would be able to reconfigure itself in a matter of microseconds. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by The Resumator, a hiring solution for small and fast-growing businesses. If you're a business executive or a hiring manager or an HR professional at your business, listen up. This is a way you can reduce time spent on hiring tasks by 50% and reduce cost per hire by as much as 85%. Uh, get rid of that HR inbox or that applicant tracking system that's all clunky with The Resumator. It's an end-to-end -end hiring package that helps manage the entire process from attracting those great applicants to selecting your next employee. Uh, we're using it right here at Twit. Uh, Twit's been growing like leaps and bounds over the past few years, but so have other companies like Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr. They all got off the ground with the Resumator. You can too. Helps with sourcing. You can attract applicants to your job using your website, free job boards, and social media connections. Then it helps you screen the applicants so you can rank them and track them, discuss resumes internally. Helps you with the interview process. You can schedule meetings with candidates, collect feedback from your team, and it helps you hire them. You can use it to collaborate and compare to select the best person for the job. Resumator helps you manage the flow of incoming applicants, the pre screening process, and communications with candidates all in one place. Do you want better control of the hiring process in your small business? Don't hire an expensive recruiting firm. Do this. Uh, hiring manager, HR professional, business owner, save some time, some money, and increase traffic to your job postings by checking out The Resumator. For a 30-day free trial and 15% discount, go to theresumator.com slash TNT. After the free trial, base package is $99 per month, and that covers five open jobs and five users, and they offer other packages as well. That's a 30-day free trial and a 15% discount at theresumator.com slash TNT. And we thank the Resumator for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss some of the stories in the news, we're very happy to have Andy Anatko of the Chicago Sun-Times and, of course, co-host of Mac Break Weekly. How's it going, Andy? Uh, moderately neato. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I'm, it's spiffy to hear that, actually. Uh, let's. You, shall we start off talking a little bit about these uh, Samsung Galaxy S4 leaks, which are partly newsworthy to me because the hype building around the 4 is, is iPhone-like, don't you think? I'd say so because uh, Samsung, Samsung had the hot phone of 2012, not by sales because the iPhone 5 still beat its butt. The iPhone 4S in the US even beat its butt. But now they have something to prove that they can continue to build the kind of phones that people are really going to want to talk about. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to be at the, uh, they're doing the launch event on Thursday. The fact that they're holding this in the little, rather little out of the wall sort of gallery space known as Radio City Music Hall kind of indicates that they've got a lot of hype uh, behind this one. Uh, I've, I've seen I've seen the leaks. I've seen the pictures. The only thing that really surprised me was that they're going with, if this is true, that the rumor said a four, uh, 14 megapixel camera. And given that 
the trend right now is not to beat a, a war of numbers, but to beat a war of image quality. I mean, we have HTC with their flagship phone saying, you know what, we're not going to give you, uh, we're not going to give you eight, even eight megapixels. We're going to give you a downsampled four that's far, far better than anything you could get uh, by, by a pocket camera, so a pocket phone so far. So we're going to see what, what comes out. But again, if uh, they really want to keep the streak going, they've got they've had three wonderful products with the with the S3, the Note 2, uh, and if they can keep that going with uh, updates to all those sort of things, maybe they'll have a halo effect that will maybe allow them to create some really good uh, full-size tablets, although I'm really not ready for that meteor to hit the earth yet. <laughs> I'm not ready for any meteors to hit the earth, but yeah, no, yeah I'm, exactly. I'm ready. I'm ready for meteors to hit the earth, especially if I could choose where they land first, and if uh, the the climate change affects me last. I need to uh, but it's, 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 if, if the, the 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 moment that that Android, there's a really good 10 inch Android tablet that makes me think, huh, I would almost like this to have to as a daily driver sort of use. That's the day that I feel as though dogs and cats are living together, and that yeah, it's yeah. time to open the gatekeeper. That's an interesting point about the 13 megapixel cameras. That's the, the rumor we're seeing today on, on Sammy Hub. I guess if you can't emphasize sensor, you just go bulk up the number and, and cross your fingers. They're also talking in this in this rumor about something called a, a green FOLED screen, uh, which uses uh, green yellow colors to make AMOLED displays 25% more efficient. I, I was not familiar with FOLED. I did a quick Wikipedia search, so I'm, you know, I'm not any expert by any stretch. But uh, apparently what FOLED does is instead of being fluorescent, it's phosphorescent. So it generates light from both the triplet and singlet excitons, allowing the internet quantum efficiency of devices to reach nearly 100%. And the upshot of all of this in, in the, in the uh, recitations on the Wikipedia article is that it increases battery life. So that could be a big thing if you've got a really sweet looking screen and they're like, hey, we're going to get amazing, you know, 12 hour battery life out of this. It would be amazing. Um it's just as possible, though, that if they're going, if they were to use this technology to extend battery life, that part of the reason why was because the design that they have otherwise is going to really, really suck down the battery. Uh, it's uh, the S3 gets about the same amount of battery life as the iPhone 5, but it has a has a battery that's about 25 percent, or rather half again, as powerful or uh, as much capacity as the iPhone 5. So uh, there's it, it just goes to show that you can put in a bigger screen, you can add in all these really cool features that that people like but there comes at a cost and uh, one of the reasons why you want to have a big uh, you want to design a phone that's physically bigger is not just to pack in that bigger screen but to give you a bigger space for to, to fill in with battery one report said they have something called a floating touch technology where you can just kind of hover over the screen which i thought was kind of a neat idea i mean i like yeah, the fact that samsung isn't just doing a, a bunch of hardware components they're, they're really doing some interesting stuff on the software side because it seems like you got all these phones they're all kind of the same but the S4 and the S series seems to have like all these gimmicks every year that seem to be like, wow, how come no other phone has this? But a floating uh, touch technology is currently that S Pen if you use that. So if you wanted to like go through your photo albums and things, it makes it a little easier. So I, I'm kind of interested in the way they're handling their software. That, that's what could kill Samsung, though. If they keep uh, if they keep designing phones that have really cool buzzworthy phrases and really cool but esoteric features that look great in the demo but don't really pay off in terms of what the user can do with it, that's how they're going to become a, a, maintain a, a second tier sort of status in terms of innovation. The Note 2 is wonderful in that it does have that active stylus. And the first, uh, I, it, the, the first time that I was able to place a dot directly at the intersection of two lines on the screen it was almost like that scene in 2001 where the apes are realizing that wait a minute i can smash a skull with this i feel real power for the first time uh, but if they're if they add things like here's a new style of screen that really doesn't look much better but it's a great new buzzword here's a new hover technology that you're going to play with but you're then you're going to go into settings and turn it off that's a waste of talent and a waste of engineering so there, there's, a, there's a lot more than just having a good uh, bus ad uh, to keeping their presence as 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 a cool phone manufacturer, and and more than trotting the cute kid Jeremy out on stage to <laughs> unleash it, hopefully, which I believe uh, they they have a follow up at it by the way with Jeremy. Uh, yeah, again, no, I saw so. that. Yeah, <laughs> Jeremy spoke in class yeah. today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's move on to. Uh, wouldn't that be funny? Let's move on to the TiVo <laughs> Mini. Why yeah. would I do this? I as I don't really know why you would do this, Tom. TiVo's got a new box, and it's called the TiVo Mini. It's designed to be your second TiVo box in your house. And what it does is it streams content from your main TiVo. It also has some internet content. You could watch Hulu Plus or YouTube or listen to Spotify. No Netflix built in. It costs 100 bucks. Like, that doesn't sound so bad. 
but there's also a $6 a month charge, or you can pay $150 for a lifetime pass. So if you want it free and clear from the start, it'll cost you 250 bucks. And that cost doesn't include your normal TiVo's subscription fee, which is like, I think, $15 per month or a lifetime fee. Andy, six bucks a month to access your own recordings from another room. What is this about? Oh, God. It, it's, it's like they're going from the same playbook where they, they're, the problem with their business is that they come up with a really wonderful product, and it only takes about two or three years for the cable companies to deliver that same experience, only with zero setup and pretty much the same monthly fee. Everybody now has DVR that, uh, that, that uh, will record shows like that. Now almost everybody has the ability to have multi-room DVR. I know I do, and I, it costs me uh, a li uh, more than $5.99 a month, but there is no initial, <laughs> initial payout. It would take a few years for me to make back the money I would spend on a TiVo box. Uh, meanwhile, you've got Sling, who's doing such smart things about uh, packaging their technology into other cable boxes so that now the people who wouldn't really consider putting a network box uh, and uh, putting this right port forwarding on their cable systems to make sure they could access their internet TV, their uh, cable TV from everywhere, now they're, uh, the, the uh, actual uh, cable companies are saying, well, what if, what if you just simply give us a little bit of money, plug this one box in, we will set up everything for you, and that's how Slingbox uh, maintains their success so oh man I, I just you're right i just don't get it and do you ever see these sort of products and you start to doubt your own intelligence just for a moment where you think is there something about this i don't understand or something about the yeah. people who buy these services i don't understand because this makes no sense to me no i i had exactly that feeling when i saw this i'm like what am i missing like am i yeah. just dumb because tivo can't be but I, I get when I buy a TiVo that I pay for the guide information, but to retransmit that same guide information over my own network doesn't <laughs> doesn't make any sense. This is an extender, and it doesn't even have the Netflix app on it, right? No. Uh, what, what would be smarter to me is, like, TiVo comes out with a Roku app yeah, and exactly. says, hey, we'll, we, you, we pay us $6 a month for a Roku app, and then you've got everything Roku has, plus you've got an extender that takes, you know, your, your stuff it, off it, your TiVo in the other room. Something that increases the value of the TiVo that you bought. Right now, there is no, there isn't a great answer to the question: Why would I buy a TiVo box? If they can say, if you give us money and give us a monthly fee, we will extend that experience to any device you have that has a screen and a pulse. And the weird thing is, the TiVo experience is somewhat locked down. If you want to get the content off of there, you do have to use something like a like a like a Sling box, or you could use. I mean, I know there's lots of tools out there for your computer that lets you access your TiVo recordings. So, I mean, I think. The weird thing about TiVo is that it's got this beautiful consumer-facing interface, but the people that really love it are the nerds who will figure out workarounds that don't want to pay six bucks a month for this. It just doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. Why on earth you have this extra fee? It's not like it comes with like a free subscription to anything else either. It's not like you get Hulu Plus at a discount or you got like Spotify Premium. It's like, no, you just get these same apps that you have on every other box, and you get to pay more for it. I just... Yeah, you get to pay monthly. You get to pay more. Like the Roku's are like seventy dollars, you know, for the for the lower models, uh, ninety nine dollars at worst. And they have Netflix <laughs> built in. I don't, Netflix is everywhere. How do they not get Netflix on this box? I well, don't. Netflix I just is, don't understand. Netflix is on the TiVo proper, so I'm not sure why right. it's not on the Mini. Maybe that's exactly. part of it. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just at a loss at TiVo. I mean, the great hardware, great interface, just behind. I think. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this generic top-level domain name thing. It's kind of an esoteric topic, so it puts some people to sleep. But I think this is interesting enough to keep most of you interested. Uh, do you think Amazon should be owning .book? They also want to own .author and .read. Now, they haven't been granted the rights to this yet. That's not coming uh, until comment periods are done. But that's what these comment periods are about. And you've got the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers at Barnes & Noble saying, oh, heck no, you know, talking in some extreme language about threats to the freedom of the internet in Barnes & Noble's cases. But it, it, it brings up a very good question. Uh, Andy, do you think that Amazon should be allowed? I mean, under the guidelines, they, they've they got technical competence. They paid the $185,000 to apply. Is it just because they're also a book publisher that they should not be allowed to do this? Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to take that kind of risk with something so important. Uh, so I, I I would be very skeptical if any player in this space, be it Barnes and Noble, Google, Apple, or Amazon, try to own a domain that's a, a TLD that's that important. On the other hand, then the question is: so who should be administering this stuff? The great thing about having Amazon or Google or Apple is that they are fully qualified and they are not going anywhere in the next two or three years, or let alone ten or twenty. Uh, and finally. 
assuming that they are a trustworthy uh, caretaker of this responsibility, you want someone who is that stable to be taking care of it. Um, my, my, my worry would be that uh, you'd have uh, like a consortium of smaller publishers, of the, 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 the people who are a little bit more desperate, people who have to really have to make their money off of selling books, administering this. And then when they start to falter, suddenly they become a little bit more susceptible to the argument, you know, whispering in the ear, what if public domain books weren't really being served as easily as commercial books? Or what if we were to rejigger this a little bit so that we could favor uh, providers that were really, really aggressive uh, against uh, copyright violations? I, I feel as though a company like Apple or Google and a little bit less Amazon are able to say, we just uh, we 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 want to make sure that the power and sewer lines that head to our factory are always working. We, it is not in our best interest to limit electricity and, and sewage services to other factories. We just want this to run, and so long as it keeps running, okay. We don't care about anything else but consistency. Google VP and CIO Ben Freed has filed a uh, a comment with ICANN, that, which is very interesting. Uh, it's getting a lot of headlines because of what it says at the very end, but most of it is a justification for allowing these top-level domains to be registered privately and be, be run in a restricted fashion. And he points out most people never go to these other TLDs. Most yeah. people still use .com. And what is interesting is Barnes & Noble, who's making a big stink about Amazon getting .book, owns book.com. <laughs> now, we can make the same argument to say, like, wait, should Barnes & Noble own Book.com? That's kind of generic, and it's going to give them an undue advantage, but it certainly has it. In fact, most of those generic .com domains don't end up being that big of an advantage. So at the end of this, this justification for allowing these top-level domains to be private, using all of those examples, Freed uh, says... On the other hand, .app, .blog, .cloud, and .search, which we've applied for, if Google gets it, we won't restrict it to Google products. So we're, we're, we're going to be a good citizen. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. I mean, not, not only are they are these custom domains not really that as relevant as we might think it is, but also think about the apps that users use to get to these stores. They never type in a URL. They're using a, a custom app that will do all the uh, do all the connections for them. So it's likely that even if uh, Google were to be switching over to uh, a dot books domain if every, if every book sale was done through this TLD, no user would ever actually see that. I mean, re really, this is a world of dot com where if you don't where uh, I, I was talking to a uh, a consultant who actually advises a lot of very, very big companies on how to do their branding. And his advice is always exactly the same, that it's better to make up a word and have a dot com than to have the place to buy books dot TK or anything that's not dot com. I mean, just looking at these these domain names, it seems like this will be great for like shortening services and things like that. Because I don't think you're going to be seeing these things anywhere. Neil the idea that you have books. to educate the consumer to be like, oh, in your URL bar, go to your book dot book. It's like, wait, <laughs> that's not a thing. I I know dot com, I know dot co dot uk, I know dot net and dot org, but you're making this up. There's no way there's a dot book. I mean, there's going to be a huge educational curve here when it comes to this because it's just it's unusual and it's going to take a while. Yeah, and and maybe. All of these concerns are worth working through now because eventually things change, right? Maybe .com won't be thought of that way anymore and people will move on. But history has shown that .info has, has not really taken over the space. .mobi um, did for all my mobile needs. All your mobile needs are, are <laughs> .mobi now. Me too. .biz. That's all my, all my businesses are on .biz. <laughs> Let's take a uh, quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, GoToMeeting by Citrix. When your entire team can get together, it's amazing what can get accomplished. But projects that take weeks suddenly just take days. You get them done right there. But gathering everybody together, that's the hard part, right? Especially in this world where everybody's traveling all over the place. People working from different locations could be time-consuming, expensive, and often plain impossible. And that's why we use GoToMeeting with HD Faces. It makes it easy for your entire team to get together online whenever you need to. It doesn't matter if the host of the show is down in Los Angeles and you're in Petaluma and the other guys all the way across the country on the eastern seaboard. Y'all get together and have a conference. Go to meeting. You share the same screen. Stay on the same page. And the built-in HD video conferencing makes your online meetings just like being in the same room. Plus, it's simple to launch or join a meeting from anywhere. You can use it on a tablet. Uh, even, or even present, you want to run the meeting, 
from your iPad. You can do that. Uh, we use it all the time for, for things where we need to get together and we need to talk about stuff with external clients who are all over the place and we want to see everybody's face on the same screen at once. Go to meeting with HD faces makes the meeting a lot easier. Try go to meeting free for 30 days. Don't wait. Use this special offer. Visit gotomeeting.com. Click the try it free button and use the promo code TNT. Remember, use that promo code TNT. And also remember, GoToMeeting has made it possible to meet from anywhere with their mobile apps, and you can present from an iPad, and it's still winter. Andy knows this. It's cold where you are, right? Uh, foot of snow in March. Hey. But I, <laughs> I still stick with what I said about San Diego. Oh, those poor idiots who have to deal with 78-degree weather every single day of the year. I like New England because we have seasons. Yeah. <laughs> the monotony could kill you, but it doesn't matter whether you're in San Diego, whether you're, you're out of the East Coast. You can host a meeting from anywhere using GoToMeeting, and you can win an iPad. Now, tweet your answer to this question. If you could host a meeting from anywhere using GoToMeeting, where would it be and why? Use the hashtag TNTiPad. And the hashtag go to meeting for a chance to win a free iPad signed by Leo Laporte, courtesy of go to meeting. Remember, to be eligible to win, you need to answer. Tell us both where you would host your go to meeting and where you would host it from and why using the hashtag TNT iPad and go to meeting. That's G O T O M E E T I N G. Contest ends in four days, folks, Friday, March 15th at 11 59 p.m. Pacific Daylight Savings Time. And the winner will be announced in the Wednesday, March 20th episode of Tech News Today. Contest, sorry, only open to U.S. residents. That's the rules. Uh, for the rest of the rules and regulations, visit inside.twit.tv. And don't forget to try GoToMeeting free today. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, MakerBot announced something. It's a funny story about this. I knew about this Friday morning before the show because they accidentally <laughs> sent their press release too early. But I noticed that it had an embargo date, and I knew Bree Pettis was speaking at South By. I'm like, can we talk about this early? They're like, we'd really appreciate it if you didn't. Uh, so we're talking about it today. A MakerBot announced a 3D digitizer prototype scanner. Yeah, so the scanner, they showed it off at of South by Southwest. The scanner uses a combination of cameras and lasers to scan an object and creates a digital file. You don't need to know anything about 3D modeling or know how to use CAD to use this. And then that file can be printed using a MakerBot replicator. Now, the digitizer can scan objects that are 8x8, eight eight, so 8 inches by 8 inches, in less than 3 minutes. So this is pretty fast. It's going to launch in the fall. Tom, I know you love 3D printing stuff, and you had this, this information on Friday, and we'd love to know known about that. But you, what, what do you think about this? I, I'm really excited about this. Uh, I know it's only eight inches by eight inches, so like not even all my action figures uh, will fit in there. But just the idea, and that's what I've always been excited about with 3D printing, is that we're in that late 70s, early 80s era of personal computing with 3D printing. Uh, and, and MakerBot is not the only one out there doing this by, by any means, but they're, they're doing it right. And I love this fact that they've now come out and said, hey, look, we're going we're gonna to be able to scan 3D images. Now, there's all kinds of problems this is going to cause, all kinds of copyright issues we're going to have to work through, but we will work through them. And in the end, this is going to be great. You've got a, a widget, you, you're a toy maker maybe, and you just want to like print out a bunch of stuff, scan it and print it. Andy, Look at that gnome. About, Andy, what do you think about this whole 3D printing ecosystem? That's what uh, Brie Pettis was talking about. I mean, it's one thing to have a printer, but it's another thing where you can actually scan something without needing to know 3D design. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like the perfect balance point of emerging technology right now, where it's complicated enough that the people who are most scared about being disrupted by this, you know, people who worry about their physical hardware designs being copied and replicated, don't understand enough about it to know how to sue against it. So it's it's sort of like the early days of scanning, the early days of color printing, where you could put a $20 bill in a scanner and scan it, then print a copy of that $20 bill just for fun and not spend it, hopefully. But uh, you, you don't, you, it's going to be a lot different in five or 10 years from now when people understand how, uh, what the what the threat points are about this technology and try to stop new ideas like this from coming out uh and but uh, mostly i'm thinking about the, the iMovie effect where how many of us were really interested in becoming movie and film editors until we got a piece of software that cost next to nothing or nothing that allowed us to just play around with it and make lots and lots of mistakes very very fast and learn those skills uh there are great tools right now for doing 3d modeling on screen but 
unless you really t uh, take a six month class, you're not going to get very far in it. The ability to simply take you know, a, a garden gnome and take it, start off with a scan of that and then use that as your reference point for doing your, you know, your, your Wookiee garden gnome or your Boba Fett cookie jar. I mean, right here, I got, I've got my, I've got my, uh, my, my R2D2 cookie jar behind me right now. Right. Very much a one of a kind thing. But the moment that someone produces a really good scan of R2D2 and makes me think, I would love to scale that up to about 10 inches high. I would love to make the top removable and I could put pencils and stuff inside of it. That's what's going to be super exciting. I'm glad that there is, it's still the wild, wild west days of 3D imaging and printing. And the other thing is like, I know I'd be scanning everything and probably modifying that. Yes. I, I usually learn by doing. So I won't know how to do 3D design, but if I get a model in there, I'll okay. mess with it as much as I can. And that's a great way just to learn how to do this stuff in general, because it's, it's I mean, you can sit there and you can have your books and you can look at your web pages and type in all these things and figure it out. But there's something about being able to go, hey, I scanned this object. I have an, an, I have an idea of how it works. Now I'll be able to modify it in ways that would make it totally different. So I'm really psyched about this just to tinker around with. I'm telling you, listen to me. The Container Store, start selling 3D printers right now. Well, <laughs> before it's too late. <laughs> uh, you probably got a few years, but still. I, I would say that's good advice. Uh, Seattle Bar banning Google Glass. Now, this is mostly a, uh, a, a kind of a PR move. Five Point Cafe, uh, w which has the slogan, alcoholics serving alcoholics since 1929. I've, I've had a pint there. It's a, it's a lovely dive bar uh, if you're serious about your dive bars. But they announced on Facebook last week, for the record, the Five Point is the first Seattle business to ban in advance Google Glasses and ass kickings will be encouraged for <laughs> violators. Uh, and they're talking about, you know, nobody wants to have their photo taken without their permission in a bar. Yeah, sure, people have phones now, but we restrict that because we can see the phone. When you got the glasses on, sometimes it's hard to tell if they're actually recording. Ken Fisher of Ars Technica uh, asked a really good question at the end of his article, said... Will, will this really change how people interact? I mean, it's fun to talk about Five Point uh, issuing the ban here, but is it going to make people more guarded in public? Andy, what do you think? I, I would say so because there's an instant distrust of a wearable device. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Mann uh, got in the news a while ago when uh, McDonald's uh, in Paris really wanted him to take off that head-mounted uh, camera in front of his eyeball. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the one hand, they the, the company handled it horribly. But on the other hand, yeah, you know what? If you've got something, a camera mounted in front of your face, you better be able to take it off because I don't care if you are in a public place. I don't care if you do have a legal right to take pictures of anybody in public. That's just not polite. And if someone is going to have a problem with that, uh, I do not condone ass kicking for any uh, anything but uh, self defense. Uh, although um, if you're kicking somebody ass, he's probably running away from you, so maybe you don't need to do that. Uh, but this is this is going to be an issue. People have a right to uh, expect a certain amount of privacy. So I, I've uh, uh, got glasses exciting because we do need to have those first. 2,000 copies of this sort of technology out in the field to really find out what people's comfort zone is. But I do think that there are going to be two uh, very important moves uh, to uh, for Google to make with Google Glass. Number one is to have some sort of a visible shutter over the lens so that you can just mechanically do this and slide a phosphorescent white dot over the camera lens so people can see, okay, it is not even physically possible for any light to hit that lens, so I'm okay right now. And the other thing is for them to contemplate, what if we were to actually do a version of this that doesn't have a camera? If we're saying that we want to remove the, the quote, emasculating experience of having to always take out your phone and look at the screen, aren't they also saying that most of what makes Google Glass awesome would be nearly just as awesome if it was just that little heads-up display that gives you information in response to voice? So I, I think that people might be focusing a little bit too much on the camera uh, when they try to think of how to sell this device because I really don't think people are ready for that. I love the stunt aspect about this, though. I mean, this idea of that you'll, there'll be ass kickings about this. It's like, well, if you have the glasses and you have the camera exactly. on, it's like, okay, glass, take a picture of the guy's kicking my ass. Like, it's, it's not a good idea. No to, video, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other thing is, like, there could be so many other, like, riffs on this. The idea of, like, okay, anytime somebody says, okay, glass, that means they have to buy a shot for everybody. I mean, you could really, <laughs> really do something with this. Uh, but, but Andy's got a great point. The idea that this needs a shutter or something, that would, I definitely think, would make people less worried about it. Well, there's a red light that supposedly comes on, but well, yeah, I guess I mean, you could disable that. You can I mean, hack it. I've right. had friends that would put post-its on their webcams. 
because they're constantly afraid that somebody's watching them. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's a, that's a possibility. But our laptops, at least for the most part, don't have shutters. So I'm just yep, like Tom right there, mm -hmm. just in case he's being watched by the man. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't want somebody watching him, you know, talking about tech news live streaming. It'd be a horrible thing. Um, right when I got a big freaking Canon G10 point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so I mean, I, I don't know if they'll introduce a shutter or people will just get used to it in time. Just because, I mean. You know, if you had a microphone on with with a, a Bluetooth headset, I mean, people don't usually go, "Are you recording this? Or are you sending this somewhere yeah. else?" Maybe people. But, and that's a that's a good still, point. Cameras on smartphones are now de rigueur, and there was a point where certain industries were saying, "You're not allowed." To have a phone, to even have a phone with a camera, they were still selling Blackberries that were the same model without the camera because of that. That that's lessened. They've learned how to deal with it. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think what most people are objecting to is that doing this is still a very very overt gesture. But if I if people don't know that, oh by the way, there is underneath the brim of this hat there is a little clip-on device that gives me 720p video. You know that's that's a difficulty. But I mean to to, to your point earlier, realize that. We've also part of it is also just how society chooses to adapt to it, because now in most polite circumstances, if I sit down to, uh, to to lunch with a friend and I take this out of my pocket and I put it face up on the table, I'm probably going to be told, OK, am I having lunch with you or am I having lunch with you during the 8 percent of your time that you're going to be focusing on me and the conversation we're having? Uh, whereas now there's sort of that social convention that says I'm putting this on the table but face down, which communicates that I'm still technically on the clock, but I've deliberately decided not to take a look at this uh, until you decide to go to the bathroom, in which case I will be checking things like a, like a madman. So yeah, I think yeah. that you just have to understand that if you walk into a place with this, you might be asked to take it off. And if you don't take it off, you might be kind of a jerk. Speaking of being kind of a jerk, Samsung's being kind of a jerk to Windows, aren't they? I guess. Yeah, I, th I believe that uh, they called Windows 8 kind of like Vista. They've, they compared it to Vista. People, oh. That's that's not a word people want to throw around around Redmond. Uh, but an analyst over at IDC, Bob O'Donnell, also made some statements about Windows 8. He's saying that he says that not allowing people to boot into the desktop and removing the start button are two things IDC's research show people miss. O'Donnell says that Windows 8 PC sales has been horribly stalled. Those are his words. And IDC thinks Microsoft should rethink the design, and it also says that PC vendors agree with it. Four months in, and people are still having issues with Windows 8 and its design. Andy, do you think Microsoft should you know, bring back old things, or should they just be going full steam ahead? Well, remember that uh, Vista might actually be an excellent analogy where uh, they did something radically different with Windows. A lot of people really didn't like it. They listened to that. And they came out with Windows 7, which really was Vista only with a lot of uh, customer feedback implemented into it. So uh, I do think that they're on the right track with these live tiles. I do think that they're on the right track with creating interfaces that will scale brutally well, no matter what kind of processor, or what kind of screen that's running. Uh, but yeah, I think that they're going to have to roll back a little bit and just give people those options. Because when you look at it, their complaints, they're, they're not, uh, when people make these consistent complaints about Windows 8, they're not complaining about things that would be incredibly difficult for, for Microsoft to address. All they have to do is spend, uh, it, it seems as though it's something they could crank out in a weekend just by adding some, some user options to it. Because uh, people just, people, uh, as much as I... As much as I would like to pontificate that, oh, you know, people are just resistant to change. They're, they they want they want their uh, they want their computers to be better and and and, and more uh, more adaptable, but they just don't want it to work any differently. On the other hand, when you hearing that when you hearing that complaint over and over and over again, you're thinking, yeah, okay, maybe people should be able to uh, boot into the desktop. Uh, it's going to be a lot different, maybe two years from now, when more people are buying the sort of notebooks and tablets that can really take advantage of Windows 8. But yeah, I think the the, the evidence is pretty clear that Microsoft might have jumped the gun a little bit. I mean, Microsoft's got a history of supporting things for the longest time. It's yeah. rare that they put these big, you know, line in the sand kind of things that are going on that are potentially irritating customers. But, but Tom, I mean, even when they when Microsoft put in that ribbon, people learn to well at least get used to it. Is this something that just people will just go in time go? All right, this is just the way it is now. Yeah, you know, Paul Thorat uh, had, had said some stuff on his blog that very similar to what Andy's saying here, which is it's sort of a TikTok strategy almost on purpose that says we're going to we're going to change things a lot from XP to Vista. And we know people are going to resist it. And we know people don't follow the upgrade cycle religiously. But then we can come with a Windows 7 that really isn't that much different. But we've had the largest beta test in the world. Uh, and we can we can now 
come out with something that satisfies all of those demands. And it's not a big change, but it changes the things everybody's really upset about. We might be seeing that here with Windows 8, where they, they made a big change. They made a huge change. And now they're seeing, okay, what are the things people really have a problem with? And what are the things that are just change and then they get over with and we can keep them? The only difference is they're no longer apparently going to be doing versions of Windows the way they have in the past. It's going to kind of merge into this continuous update cycle with Windows Blue, which I can't tell, is, is that a service pack or is that a new version of Windows that's coming in the summer? Uh, so how that plays out in the rollout, I'm, I'm interested to see. What, are they going to put... The start menu back in as an option in Windows Blue, or is that something they hold until down the road? I don't know. I mean, see, the thing about Vista that I think is an unfair comparison is that Vista just broke things. I mean, there were driver support <laughs> issues, sure. and there were there was hardware failing. It just couldn't find anything, and you couldn't oh, you know, DVD spinning, and I can't find the DVD drivers. It's like that makes no sense. Uh, Windows uh, Seven didn't break it. I mean, it fixed a lot of that that mess, and Windows Eight doesn't fix anything Windows 7 broke. So like it's got this kind of this success problem. 7 was very good and 8's really good as well. But the thing is it's this not having that old security blanket. I think people are going to get used to it. But I think the biggest problem is that Microsoft called it Windows. And that's the thing that people don't understand. They're like, what's this giant tiled thing? I'm supposed <laughs> to be seeing Windows. I'm supposed to see a desktop. And where's my giant, beautiful, green rolling grass or whatever the heck uh, Vista's uh, or whatever the wallpaper was. But it's it's. I think people are going to get used to this in time, and Microsoft should. I would say this: do not bring back the start button. There's no need for it. Mm -hmm. You got you've got this thing. Go with it full steam ahead. Yeah. At the same time, we can't ignore how important an update this is. That uh, is, is going to be a time two years from now, maybe three years from now, when everybody's going to be expecting their desktops to have some form of multi-touch on the screen. When uh, the current class of i5, i7, multi-core process, excuse me, traditional desktop multi-core processors are really not going to be in the products that people want. The people are going to want cheap, flexible, 18-hour battery devices uh, that uh, uh, attend to the attend to the basics of Microsoft Office and the other little games that they do. Uh, and they're going to need a new operating system that has both the user interface and the sort of power management and uh, CPU management that can support that sort of stuff. So that's why I'm cons I wouldn't say I'm concerned about Apple, but I'm hoping to see sometime in the next year some vision uh, that, that Apple has that the next generation of desktop uh, uh, operating systems are going to address this shift. Because like, people are defining uh, computers as their phones. Their first uh, computer that kids are using now are phones and not, uh, not, uh, and not uh, traditional desktops. Their interface is not we, – we grew up with uh, mouses and keyboards, and now kids are growing up with touchscreens. So uh, I have to applaud uh, Microsoft for at least being this aggressive and saying, yep, maybe this first version of Windows 8 is going to kind of stink. But we have to take these first stumbles before we can walk confidently in, in 2014, 2015. Yeah, I mean, with Vista, they found out, oh, people don't like it when device drivers don't work. And, people and so people now, like to print things. Yeah, with Windows 8, they're like, well, we'll find out what tiles they like and all that sort of thing. Let's, uh, let's move on to the randomizer. randomizer. Not much to say about this except awesome. Uh, Mike Mika has hacked a copy of Donkey Kong so that the princess is the actual playable character, and Mario needs to be saved. Uh, after his daughter, who was used to playing as the Princess Toadstool in Super Mario Brothers 2, was playing Donkey Kong, was like, well, why can't I switch characters? I want, I want to play as the princess. So he's like, well, all right, I'll, I'll uh, rewrite some frames. There you go. I absolutely love this story. I mean, like, it just reminds me of the idea how my kid doesn't understand that you can't watch videos on demand. Like, they're always on demand. You can watch them whenever. But this idea of like, hey, why can't I play this character? This should be a thing. Like, I, I could imagine this being a little cottage industry of, I'm going to switch up the characters. This is just, like, this is the best dad ever. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on the other hand, I, I absolutely agree with you, and I think that it, uh, smart companies are going to listen to this sort of thing and say, well, tell you what, we can choose the gender of the character, we can even customize the character for whatever the person wants to do. At the other hand, on the other hand, though, just to be just because we're on a podcast and we're supposed to be talking about arg arguing about silly things, remember how upset everybody was justifiably about uh, the, the clean fix phenomenon in, in Utah, where the companies would, uh, video stores would like buy commercial DVDs and then re-edit them so that all the nudity and all the bad language and the more gory uh, details of it uh, would be edited out. And so they have a movie that parents think that they could watch cleanly with their kids. Uh, and so 
at what point do we have the discussion about how someone created this video game and told this story with these characters in mind that they don't if so if maybe it's correct for a, a user to choose to change the gender of their character but is that still the the story that this creator wanted to tell and is that part of our right as people who uh, buy these games i I think that uh, this is a harmless thing and a really positive thing, but uh, it's, it's kind of like uh, with the with the, with the uh, MakerBot stuff, where five years from now we might have these questions really as part of a serious serious forum topic. Remix culture, dude. I got the right to play as the donkey. There's no donkey. Uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm gonna be the barrel. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it is what's, this is, what's this is Kong's remix culture, story, huh? How did he yeah. get? We could do sort of a <laughs> wicked sort of thing, like a, a Broadway <laughs> totally. musical, and find out. You know, Absolutely. If if Kong is upset with Mario, maybe there's a reason why he's upset with Mario. <laughs> Let's take a uh, quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Gazelle. If you want that new Samsung Galaxy S4, or maybe you want uh, that new iPad that's rumored to be coming, or or some other great phone that's out there, HTC's got new phones. I, iPhone's still awesome. Before you get your new phone, if you already upgraded to the next big thing, make sure you sell your used phone or gadget to Gazelle for cash. Don't give away or bury last year's gadget in a drawer. Find out what it's worth at gazelle.com. Just go to G A Z E L L E.com. Find your item. Tell Gazelle the condition they'll even buy broken iphones and ipads so be honest you'll probably get some money get a risk-free offer for your gadgets gazelle locks in that quote for 30 days and you get paid fast by check or paypal go to gazelle.com now get an offer for your iphone your samsung galaxy s your htc your blackberry smartphone ipad other apple products do it today because your gadgets don't get more valuable over time unless you wait decades that's too long clean out that drawer Get some quick cash. What's your iPhone, iPad, or Android smartphone worth? Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com to find out. Sell your used iPhone or Samsung Galaxy smartphone today at gazelle.com. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Well, we got one thing on the calendar. What is it, IS? <laughs> well, the Search Marketing Expo takes place starting today in San Jose, and it runs through Wednesday. And the calendar. Right. Keep an eye on that. Uh, the, the, there'll be new SEO tips coming out there. You can count on it. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We got an email from Paulina. She says, hello, TNT crew. I was listening to your discussion about Google Glass, being able to recognize your friends by what they are wearing, and found it really silly. Tom mentioned that some people cannot recognize faces. This disorder is called prosopagnosia. But this is not due to problems with their eyes. It is due to damage to certain areas of their brain. These individuals already have alternative ways of recognizing their friends. I have a feeling they would be more accurate at doing this than a computer. I do not have prosopagnosia. However, I do have severe visual impairments. As a result, I cannot see faces of friends from afar. I primarily use the way the person is walking. Everyone has a unique walk along with certain cues, such as height, hairstyle, and yes, even clothing. If it's winter and someone has a distinctive coat that they always wear, for example, to recognize them. I would not need Google Glass to do this for me. However, if I have not planned on meeting someone or I'm not paying attention, I do miss people who wave to me or whatnot and often have to explain to myself if the person does not know my visual difficulties. What would be amazing is if Google Glass could recognize faces, but that is a very complex process that occurs in the brain, and even scientists don't understand how it works, so I doubt that Google Glass could do this with high accuracy. I, you know, there's a few people in the chat room say the same thing, like recognizing by clothing is stupid. I think people just don't believe it's going to work very well, and that may be a fair criticism. But I think Paulina's saying that she herself needs help sometimes in identifying people. If this worked really well, and that person who's waving at you just popped up a name on your glass, no matter how the glass is doing it, I think that I think I think that's that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, sure, I this is not going to cure prosopagnosia, but it can't hurt, right? Yeah, and it's, it's, it would be really cool if we expanded the definition of assistive devices beyond like cochlear implants, to, to, to beyond like the, the sea leg for, for amputees, and started understanding that uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with the brain, and some of them affect your ability to socialize and interact with the outside world. So if you have this assistive device that not only will tell you that this is, here is the name of this person that you're dealing with, but also with people who might have onset dementia who can say, it is now very, very important, this, this is a hot device, you don't want to touch this with your bare hands. Uh, and and you've you've you set something on this you uh, uh, you set the water running three minutes ago you want to make sure that you check that again before the tub overflows uh th it's those kind of apps are going to be more exciting not just you know taking pictures of people uh, going down roller coasters for me 
There's just, it's so funny. There, there's still people in the chat room like, what problem does this solve? This is ridiculous. I, I think people just, I don't know. They just don't like the idea of it. But to me, yeah. more information is better. So if it works. Yeah, let, let's, let's put yeah. this out there and find out what problems it solves. Who, who would yeah, have figured yeah. out that uh, the, the Mario is a problem in, in Donkey Kong that needed to be solved by, <laughs> by switching the gender? But it turns exactly. out that, yeah, that is a cool thing to do. <laughs> All right. Well, that is about wraps it up for us. Andy Nako, a uh, pleasure as always. Thanks for taking the time to hang out with us today, man. Always a slice. It's nice to socialize on a Monday afternoon. That's great. Uh, and and uh, I hope we've warmed you with our conversation. Uh, <laughs> let folks know where they can they can find you online, find all your work, all that good stuff. Uh, you can find my stuff at the Chicago Sun-Times, suntimes.com. Also, I'm writing a lot of stuff for Tech Hive these days. Uh, and you can also go visit me if you can spell my last name at Anatko on Twitter or go to anatko.com. That has my, uh, my blog, links to the stuff that I'm writing and my podcast, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I really enjoyed the the switching to Android thing you did on Tech Hive. Is the third part out yet? Yeah, the third part out was out last week. Uh, there's going to be one follow-up this week where I take a lot of uh, questions that have been coming in about it and just address them quickly one by one, including what does it feel like to have no soul anymore? <laughs> no. <laughs> of course. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what it's like. <laughs> well, thanks again, Andy. Appreciate it. Uh, folks, thanks don't for forget you can submit stories to us. Technewstoday.reddit.com is the place to let us know what stories you'd like us to cover. You can also find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us TNT at twit.tv. Give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. 260-TNT-SHOW. I will be back in Petaluma tomorrow. Sarah Lane will be back on Skype tomorrow. And we'll have Jeff Kanata as our guest. We'll see you then. Hey.